My name is Jason Sturmer Roberts, and I was born on January 13th, 113. And much to my curiosity, there is a numerological meaning to this number. It represents lying, or lies, hoaxes. In fact, the number even looks like the word lie if you turn the three backwards to form an E. You see? There's also a passage in the Talmud associated with the number. Bavakama 113a. A Jew may use lies to circumvent a Gentile. I paraphrase, of course. Um, and so, being born on this date, what does that mean? Well, I could be glum about it and woe is me, my life is one big lie, but that's just not true. My interpretation is that it means that I am destined to expose the lies. I've already exposed a great many already, and I will continue to do so. I got a lot more on my plate. In part three of this series, I shall begin to double check the empirical evidence of the Big Bang Theory and see if it passed muster. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. Now, I have no doubt that scientists who have a lot more experience in their fields than me will come back with their responses and will have a back and forth because for me, being skeptical by nature, all this science has to be double checked. On with the show. Uh, okay, this is from University of Louisville. So, take a look at this. Um, the Big Bang Theory. How and when did the universe begin? Well, they have points of, points of discussion. The birth of the universe. Evidence of the Big Bang Theory. And you can see that this is the sum of the bit evidence of the Big Bang Theory. They have uh, cosmic background radiation. And this picture, elemental composition of the universe, and the Doppler redshift evidence. And that's it. That's all the evidence of the Big Bang, okay? <laughs> Is those, those three things. And the second thing, I'm not even sure how that proves anything. But the, the third and the first thing seem to be the ones that that's the entirety of the, evi the, the uh, physical evidence they have. So we're going to be debunking that right now in this video. The religion of everything coming from a single unified point, the whole thing is dead in the water if the universe is not expanding. That's the most apparent evidence of the Big Bang that the universe is expanding, and thus was always expanding, all the way back to when it was just a single point. And you know... Nobody thought the universe was expanding until a few years after the Big Bang Theory came out when suddenly Edwin Hubble came out of the woodwork and said, yes, we have evidence the universe is expanding. What's the evidence of that? Well, the main thing is redshift. Objects traveling away from us, any radiation they emit, its wavelength would be stretched longer and thus redder than normal. Hubble observed that distant galaxies were redshifted and thus moving away from us. Looking at the sky with the naked eye, it's not obvious that there's any redshift. The stars are all just white. Most of the high definition time-lapse videos online of the Milky Way do appear to have a reddish tint, but there's also bluish tint. There's as much blue as there is red. Shouldn't the overall hue be red? Are we to believe that the red stars are moving away from us and the blue stars are moving towards us? and so fast as to change the frequency of light emitted, which is kind of a high speed. You know, stars haven't changed their position on the sky for thousands of years. The Egyptians placed their pyramids to mimic the positions of Orion's belt, and Orion's belt is still there in the exact same position. Wait, hold the phone. That's not what the Milky Way looks like. I lived in the mountains as a kid, and it's not that color. It's this color. It's just white. They're colorizing these videos. Birth, an entire explosion. Rapid expansion, we call it inflation. There is the big... In 1964, the cosmic microwave background radiation was discovered, which was crucial evidence in favor of the hot Big Bang model, since that theory predicted a uniform background radiation throughout the universe. The latest data shows that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. Anyways, 
Hubble came up with a fancy telescope that can see farther than we can see. And you can see these pictures of what they call the extreme deep field. And from a tiny area of the sky, you see these photos that are just chock full of galaxies. And they're all different colors. I don't suppose they could just fake these photos, could they? Have you looked into a telescope and seen them with your own eye? No, you got to trust the uh, experts. Here, let me show you this website exchange on this picture. And in a couple minutes, the evidence will just fall apart. Here, take a look here. Um, I see no overall red pattern, though. There's even green ones. Look at these. These are all galaxies, right? Some of them are green. This one's green. This one's green. Green. Now, what's interesting about this is according to this website, there are no green stars. <laughs> Why are there no green stars? In fact, any time of the year you can find colors in the sky. Most stars look white, but the brightest ones show color. Red, orange, yellow, blue, almost all the colors of the rainbow. But hey, wait a sec. Where are the green stars? Shouldn't we see them? Nope, it's a common question, but in fact, we don't see any green stars at all. And they go through a long explanation. Right here. So, the only way to see a star as being green is for it to be only emitting green light. But as you can see from the graph above, that's pretty much impossible. Any star emitting mostly green will be putting out lots of red and blue as well making the star look white. Changing the star's temperature will make it look orange or yellow or red or blue, but you just can't get green. Our eyes simply won't see it that way. We'll tell that to this one. Look at that. An entire galaxy is green. But they say it's impossible. But then they got a funny thing here. Note, this is not the end of the story. There are green objects in space, and some stars do appear green. But that's for another post coming soon. Promise. They just contradict themselves. Why are there no green stars? Note, some stars do appear green, but they're not green. What? So, there are no green stars, but there are green galaxies. Oh, that's interesting. An entire galaxy entirely made of green. I was wondering, what are the green objects that you see scattered in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image? Um... Yeah, but things that are red appear red due to redshift. Why do some appear green, or are they green to begin with? Redshift isn't the only th reason things are red. Some objects are simply red in color. Other objects are reddened because there is dust or gas between us and them. Well, that could be a reason there's redshift. There's so many other explanations for red stars. Some objects can just be green. Also, objects that are very blue can be redshifted to appear green. Uh, redshift doesn't just make things appear red. It just moves the wavelengths towards the red end of the spectrum, i.e. towards longer wavelengths. It's very possible for something to be in the UV and end up shifting redward just enough that it now peaks in the green part of the visible spectrum. I'm not saying that's why some of these galaxies appear green, but that's how redshifting works. Oh, wait a second. Do we know from what color these these stars are redshifting from, or these galaxies are redshifting from? How do we know that? We don't know. So they're saying, you know, it's redshifting. But how do we know it's redshifting if we don't know the beginning color? The beginning color could be anything. It could be blue, green, white, red. So how do you know it's shifting and not the original color? You don't know that. You don't know the original color. So you have no, <laughs> you have no base from which to tell that it's shifting. Protocol number nine. Christian youth destroyed. 10. We have fooled, bemused, and corrupted the youth of the Goyim by rearing them in principles and theories which are known to us to be false, although it is they that have been inculcated. All you see is the end point, the end of the shift. You don't see the beginning of the shift. You don't see what it shifted from. You have no idea what it shifted from. You have no idea what color all these stars and galaxies shifted from. Do you? So how do you know it shifted at all? Wait, hold on, cut the music. 
This is not actually how they detect redshift. This is how they do it. The atoms of elements that are in the atmosphere of a star absorb specific wavelengths of light. This can tell us the chemical makeup of the star, as well as its relative distance from the Earth. We can see the absorption of these different wavelengths when looking at the light spectrum of a star, also known as Fraunhofer lines. The black lines show us where light is being absorbed. We can tell the exact wavelength of light being absorbed. When a star is moving away, the light from the star, because of the Doppler effect, is of a lower frequency than expected. It moves towards the red frequencies, red shift. Hubble noticed that most of the galaxy's light was shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. And also, the further away a galaxy was, the more its light was red shifted. Look at these two atomic spectra, one from our Sun and the other from a distant star. Remember, low frequency visible light is red and high frequency visible light is blue. The lines in the spectra are the same pattern, but they have been shifted to the red end of the spectrum of the distant star. Hubble concluded that most galaxies were moving away from our own. The further away a galaxy was, the faster it was moving away from us, and the universe is expanding. Okay, so this looks a little more verifiable than just looking at the tint of the light. But still, this can all be faked. If that Hubble photo can be faked, and I showed you how fake that was, that was really fake, then these black lines on a spectrum can also be faked. We are underestimating these occultists' ability to lie with one voice. Okay, so let's take a look at Fraunhofer lines and what they are and how they get them. And uh, I found a lot. I found a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of fake news in this Fraunhofer line business. Okay, so when you look up Fraunhofer lines, you get a bunch of these images, and these are the spectral lines of the sun. Fraunhofer essentially did the sun, and you'll see different uh, elements, too, when you look it up. Um, so here's the Fraunhofer lines, and it's the same, right? You see D right there, D right there, C right there, C right there. So you can see it's all the same uh, spectrum of the sun. Here, take a look at this meme. In 1814, Fraunhofer studied and measured the dark lines in the solar spectrum. 45 years later, it was noticed that the lines coincide with emission lines in the spectra of heated elements. The discovery allows us to determine the composition of the sun. And so you can see, oh, they found this is, these lines mean calcium, these lines mean hydrogen, these mean iron, this means helium, sodium, right? And they talk about, oh, flat, flat earthers say they can't determine the composition of the sun. Now I'm no flat earther. I think the I think the Earth is round, but I think Fraunhofer is bogus. And let me tell you why. You know, according to science, the Sun is only helium and hydrogen, and one percent or less than one percent any other element. So I don't know why how they're picking up sodium when the Sun is less than one percent sodium, less than one percent iron, less than one percent calcium. This should be what you mostly see: hydrogen and maybe some helium. Uh, however. What's strange is the reaction in the sun that's generating the light, correct me if I'm wrong, is nuclear fusion, which is hydrogen fusing and becoming helium, right? So how are you get that's the main that's the main source of the light, am I wrong? So how are you getting both helium and hydrogen? Wouldn't that be one light source, the hydrogen becoming helium? That's the light. So, so why do you get hydrogen and helium? Uh, the answer is in how they detect it. They detect it, they figured out these lines in a completely different way. Here, take a look here. This is the actual one and you go, look at all those lines. You can pick out which line is from which element. This says it best. How do astronomers identify different elements from the combined emission spectrum of multiple substances? It is said that the spectral lines of a particular atom or molecule is unique, and this could be used to identify the substance by comparing the spectrum with the existing library of spectra of different atoms. How did they get the library of spectra of different atoms? That's a good question. Uh, in other words, spectral lines are like the finger 
prints which help to identify different substances. This is used by astronomers to identify the composition of different stars and planets. How would you get different planets? Oh, yeah, the light, I guess. Bounce, the light bouncing off the planets? Hmm. Usually stars and planets have diverse composition, i.e. have different atoms, molecules, and compounds. So the spectrum observed from these sources must have spectral lines belonging to each and every substance superposed on one another. Superimposed on one another, it should be, right? Let us assume star X contains two elements, A and B, for which the spectral lines are already known and are given in the first and second spectra in the following figure. When astronomers analyze the light from star X, they would be seeing something like the third spectrum in the following figure. This is just for representational purposes. Most of them you'll find are just for representational purposes. My doubt is, on seeing only the third spectrum, how can an astronomer conclude star X is made of elements A and B? Why can't it be made of element C alone, which matches the third spectrum all by itself? How do they know which spectral line belongs to which element? How do you know which line belongs to which element? Look at that sea of lines. There's like a th there's thousands of lines. <laughs> you tell me they know that for sure? We've considered just two elements, but in reality there will be even more. So the process of finding the composition becomes even more complicated. We've seen how difficult it would be to identify the elements. But in addition to this, they find the relative composition of elements in distant stars and planets based on spectral lines. How do they do this? To put this question in some common terms, how do investigators identify different criminals when each and everyone places their fingerprint on the same location such that the patterns overlap? I think that's a good question. I think a good analogy, too. Let's see what some of these question answers are. No, these answers, none of these answers are any good. You can check them out for yourself. Like this one. This is a personal incredulity question. Yes, you don't believe it. It's not incredible. You underestimate the accuracy of the measurements and the painstaking effort that provided the reference data. I think you're overestimating them, and I'll show you why. Alchemist, see it. Alchemist. Why are they? These people are alchemists. And here's the here's this answer. But again, it's not believable. Okay, so anyways, Fraunhofer lines. Imagine identifying all these elements. That's if they have Fraunhofer lines of individual elements. Well, let's take a look at the Fraunhofer lines of individual elements. Okay, here's Fraunhofer lines of individual elements. I don't know if they're, well, yeah, they're named after Fraunhofer. I don't know if he did them himself. But you'll get things like this one, or this one. Sodium, hydrogen, calcium, mercury. Sodium, hydrogen, calcium, magnesium, neon. Okay, so how do they get, how do they get these Fraunhofer lines? Okay, Fraunhofer line. Take a look at this. There you go. Oh, these are different for different elements. They have different lines they create. Um, the D1 and D2 lines form the well-known sodium doublet, the center wavelength of which is given the de designated letter D. This historical designation for this line has stuck and is given to all the transitions between the ground state and the first excited state of the other alkali atoms as well. So wait, so it's, they were, it was given to all the other alkali atoms. Uh, did they test the other alkali atoms besides sodium? Maybe, maybe not. Um, the D1 and D2 lines correspond to the fine structure splitting of the excited states. This is how they do it. Okay, the, a demonstration of the emission sodium D lines using a wick with salt water in a flame. So they got salt water and then it burns on a wick and then the light from the flame goes through a prism and then they get the Fraunhofer lines, right? Okay. Now supposing sodium was burning in the sun, is it going to be the same as it burning in a candle like this on this wick? I mean this wick, what is really burning here? The wick is burning. So what's what's burning here is like cotton, the cotton wick, whatever the wick is made of, that's burning. Is it picking up that? What What's in the wick that's burning? Is salt burning? 
This is supposed to be sodium. Is just sodium the element burning? No, they, they have not got the element sodium. They just have sodium chloride burning. So there's sodium chloride burning on a wick, which is also burning. And this is creating, this is supposed to tell you what's happening in the sun. Well, if sodium is burning in the sun, that's during, that's nuclear fusion. That's a completely different thing than, completely different temperature. And it's supposed to show you, here. Oh, here, let me show you how it works. The formation of spectral lines. By the end of this section, you'll be able to explain how emission line spectra and absorption line spectra are formed. We can use Bohr's model of an atom to understand how spectral lines are formed. The concept of energy levels of the electron orbits in atoms leads naturally to an explanation of why atoms absorb or emit only specific energies or wavelengths of light. Let's look at the hydrogen atom from the perspective of the Bohr model. Suppose a beam of white light, which consists of photons of all visible wavelengths, shine through a gas of atomic hydrogen. Well, suppose, suppose this is happening. Is this how they did it? Or is this how they suppose that th they did it? For, for salt, I mean for not even salt, not even salt. For sodium, they drenched a wick with sodium chloride and set it on fire. But for here, they put, they shine pure white light through hydrogen gas, pure hydrogen gas. Now, never mind, was there any other gas or was this in a vacuum? Was it just through hydrogen gas or was it through air too? Was there any air involved before the hydrogen tank or after the hydrogen tank or was, you know, there's all, all these questions. I find it a little different than what's happening in the sun. A photon of wavelength that has just the right energy to raise an electron in a hydrogen atom from the second to the third orbit. No, wait, now this is hydrogen atom at room temperature or hydrogen gas. So this is hydrogen gas at room temperature. A photon can raise the energy from the second to the third orbit. Well, is that the same as what's happening in the sun? What energy level is hydrogen in the sun? Thus, all the photons of different energies or wavelengths streamed by the hydrogen atoms, photons with this particular wavelength, can be absorbed by those atoms whose electrons are orbiting on the second level. When they are absorbed, the electrons on the second level will move to the third level, and number of photons of this wavelength will be missing from the, and these wavelengths of energy will be missing from the general stream of white light. And this is what it looks like here. What they say it looks like. Who knows if any of this is real? Similar pictures can be drawn for atoms of other than hydrogen. However, because these atoms ordinarily have more than one electron each, the orbits of their electrons are much more complicated and the spectra more complex as well. Well, it didn't stop them from doing sodium, magnesium. For our purposes, the key conclusion is this. Each type of atom has its own unique pattern of electron orbits. No two set of orbits are exactly alike. Um, but anyway, the main, the main point here is they did it by shining a light through hydrogen gas, probably at room temperature. But that's not what's happening in the sun. What's happening in the sun is hydrogen is f undergoing nuclear fusion and emitting light. The hydrogen itself is emitting light. Light, you know, I guess light is passing through hydrogen, but hydrogen is also the thing emitting the light. So it's a completely different situation. One is just light at room temperature going through hydrogen. So I guess it would be here they're recording the shadow of hydrogen. Kind of different than what's happening in the sun. Now, how could they test what different elements are doing in the sun? Well, they'd have to do nuclear fusion, wouldn't they? They'd have to, they'd have to do nuclear fusion of hydrogen. So they'd have to do a fusion bomb test and then do the Fraunhofer lines of that. Is that what they did? That doesn't appear to be what they did. Instead, they did this. <laughs> okay, and that's for sodium. What about uh, helium? Did they burn helium? I don't, you can't really burn helium. Helium is an inert gas. Suppose we have a container of hydrogen gas through which a whole series of photons is passing, allowing many electrons to move up to higher levels. When we turn off the light source, these electrons fall back down from larger to smaller orbits and emit photons of light. But again, only light of those energies or wavelengths that correspond to energy difference between possible orbits. Okay, well, what's the electron energy level in the sun? Did we replicate that? I don't think we did, unless it's during a nuclear fusion bomb test.
Let's see, wait, wait, wait. Astronomers and physicists have worked hard to learn the lines that go with each element by studying the way atoms absorb and emit light in laboratories here on Earth. It uses knowledge to identify elements and celestial bodies. In this way, we now know the chemical makeup of not just any star, but even galaxies of stars so distant that their light start on its way to us long before the Earth had even formed. Galaxies. If other galaxies are even real. I'm not sure that they're even real anymore. I think these, these guys could be making up pictures. But if they are real, the galaxy, if you see a galaxy, is just one point of light. And so how are you delineating between the different stars? So you, so you have, it's a, it's a thousand fingerprints on one area on top of each other. And then on top of that, you have millions of stars on top of one another. And you're going to be able to distinguish between different Fraunhofer lines. You got to be kidding me. Yeah. See, this is how they do it. Imagine a beam of white light coming toward you through some cooler gas. Some of the re-emitted light is, is actually returned to the beam of white light you see, but it fills in the absorption lines only to a slight extent. Yeah, see, this is how they, th this is how they think they do it. Source of continuous spectrum, cloud of gas, so they shine the light through the gas. That's not, what happened, that's not what's happening in the sun. Mostly the light is emitted from the gas. The gas itself is glowing. Am I wrong? It's a completely different thing. You can't, you couldn't do this unless you were actually, unless this was a nuclear fusion reaction. And, you ha and the light from that, it would have to be an actual fusion bomb. You'd have to use a fusion bomb to find the spectrum or to replicate it. Therefore, if they haven't done a fusion bomb uh, Fraunhofer lines, then they have nothing to compare the sun to. All they have is light shine through lukewarm gas. <laughs> o Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Ding, ding, ding. Now, it turns out they do have different types of stellar spectroscopy. They have continuum spectrum, absorption spectrum, emission spectrum. Okay. So they do have different kinds of these. However, they need to prove that each of these work and how they work to verify to us that they're not just hoaxing us. Okay. You know, like I see a stellar spectra. Okay. So we have a stellar spectrum here. The spectrum below is an intensity plot of a star. Which star? Doesn't tell you which star. Can you see which star it is? They don't tell you. They just say, oh, these are the absorption lines. Could be a completely fake graph. They need to prove all this stuff to us, okay? Emission nebulae, galaxy spectra. And they show you this thing and they go, well, this one has no redshift. How do I know that? Uh, oh, examples of galactic spectra obtained by the 2DF galaxy redshift survey are shown below. Which galaxy is this? 2DF galaxy? The quasar shown has a redshift of 2.3251 as measured from the shift in the lines of, for this spectrum. Again, which quasar is this? 2DF quasar survey. Characteristic QSO spectrum. So which quasar is this? Can we replicate this experiment on our own and pointing at these particular quasar that they're pointing at? No, we can't. Not without in tremendous instrumentation. And even if we had the instruments, we couldn't because we don't know which quasar this is. We don't know which star this is. Or we don't know which galaxy this is. We don't know which nebula this is. We don't know which star this is. Wait, do we know what nebula this is? Oh, I don't know. This is, we do know the nebula. Such as M42, the Great Nebula in Orion, and the Etna Carinae Nebula, shown at right. Okay, so they do. Shown at right? Well, there's nothing on the right. Imagine how hard it is to, to double check this stuff and prove it to the layman, okay? A lot of the, most of this stuff is just like, 
Well, it's really complicated, and look, here's an example of what we do, but just trust us. Okay, my second objection to this is just this photo just looks fake, okay? Uh, I mean, the galaxies that are comparable in size are quite close together. Look at these. these they're comparable in size, and they're very close together. Well, then they must be actually that close in real life. And these, so these are way closer than any galaxies are close to ours. It's just much more jam-packed than what we see closer to our neighborhood. But then again, this is supposed to be a glimpse of an earlier age of the universe when it was smaller and more claustrophobic. So granted, it does fit the theory, but it still looks fake. Okay, my second issue is the coloring. Uh, you know, these galaxies are all made up of millions and billions of stars. Are we supposed to believe that all the stars in this galaxy just so happen to be red? And this galaxy, green, like all every star here is green, or the vast majority is green. And remember what that other one said. It said if, if there's... if it appears green, then there must include blue and red, and it would end up white. So this one, they're all, they all manage to be in the green color, and here they're all the red color. And here they're all the pink color. And here they're all yellow. Every star is different, and so wouldn't each galaxy be multicolored and therefore blend into a general mishmash color? Wouldn't it really happen that one galaxy was entirely pink? which means that stars are overwhelmingly pink. I think that's weird. Especially knowing the classification of stars like red giants, white dwarves, etc. Here, let me show you a picture. Yeah, so you look at the classification of stars. These are the different kinds of stars according to scientists. And they're all, and you know, every star can end up different. And so how is it that one galaxy has all one type of star and this one has all another type of star and that star doesn't even exist. The green stars don't exist. You know what I mean? While we're on the topic of what types of stars there are, let me just ask you guys a question. And you can tell me whether or not I'm taking crazy pills. You can see the different types of stars they say there are. Yellow dwarfs, red giants, blue giants, etc. Where are they? All the stars in the sky are just white. I've never seen any yellow, red, or blue stars in the sky. Let's take a look at an example of this red supergiant named Beetlejuice, and see if it looks like this. Well, there it is, at the left shoulder of Orion. That's this? A red supergiant? I don't see it. It does appear to be a little different shade than the rest of the stars, sure. But not this. An off-white supergiant? Okay, fine. Evidently, there's a long history of astronomers calling Beetlejuice reddish, like Ptolemy, so I guess I'll let it slide, but it doesn't look like that. This is what is known as exaggeration. You know, the ancient Chinese historian Sima Qian, he called it yellow. Beetlejuice. This is how accurate the color measurement of stars has been over the years. You just have to, you know, eyeball it. Okay, so. Well, let's keep reading this. This is, this is hilarious. You'll find this hilarious. This is the official kind of answer that people like. Um, to answer your question literally, then, the green objects are galaxies. However, I believe what you probably mean to ask is, why are these galaxies green? To answer that, there are actual number of points to address. You seem to be under the belief that the concept of redshifting causes objects to appear red. Pfft. While this is certainly a true statement, it is not exclusively true. Redshifting simply makes wavelengths longer and thus shifted redward towards the red end of the spectrum, it is certainly possible that an object that was once blue could be red shifted into the red and thus appear more red than it actually is. However, you, again, there's no way of telling what color it shifted from. All we get is the sh color it shifted to. Uh, however, an object that emitted most strongly in the UV could red shift into the green and thus appear more green than it actually is. Not according to the, the other website. Some such effect may be going on in this image, but in actuality, I think there's other stuff going on. You have to account for image processing. It's very difficult to take a real color image of a galaxy. Very often, as was the case with the HUDF, which is what this is, 
Hub, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Images are taken in a few different color bands and combined together with some sort of image processing program. It's up to the discretion of the image processor to balance the colors correctly, get the right saturation, hues, luminosities, etc. There are actually a variety of different forms of the HUDF that include different bands and different forms of imaging processes where the images that appear green in your image don't appear green in those. An example is shown below of a rendition of the HUDF taken directly from this, the website you found your image on. The coloration is significantly different than yours, and many of the greenish galaxies from your image appear more blue. Let's take a look. So here you see these four. All right, take, remember those four. And here's the four again. And you go, oh, there's different colors. Here the colors are brighter. Here, totally different color. I mean, not totally different, but it's different anyways, right? That's not pink anymore. Now it's blue. It's bluish. It's like turquoise. Here it's pink. <laughs> they just changed the colors. But we're supposed to get evidence of redshift from these, these, uh, these pictures. Okay, so you guys are upset because the collider thing disproved your theories? Uh, it's worse than that. It hasn't found anything in years. So we don't know if we're right. We don't know if we're wrong. We don't know where to go next. So they just changed the colors. Now here it says that some of these galaxies actually are green. Yeah, but how? How are they green when there are no green stars? And how are they uniformly green? Every star in there is green. All right, let's take a look, let's look at this one. Is this image captured by the Hubble telescope an original image? Is this image an original picture which is not photoshopped? I'm curious whether they are real images or not. All images provided from large telescopes are a rendering of the data for viewing pleasure. Usually sensors are sensitive to a wide range of wavelength, even outside what humans can perceive, and color is added by using filters. Hubble uses infrared filters and the so-called Hubble palette. False color. So if you mean, do these pictures show what a human observer will see? No, they don't. They're a visualization of the data collected. Now listen to this. All things observed at low light conditions are black and white as humans lose color vision at low light. So, uh, so these are actually black and white photos. There, are, there is no color. They add color later. Here's some great answers here. One way to think of it... Oh, this is great. This, this, this is a knee slapper. One way to think of it is that modern telescopes simply don't take natural color images like a camera. You're probably familiar with an infrared camera or indeed just an x-ray machine at the doctor's. Those don't take real images in any meaningful way, right? There simply is no real image of an infrared image. If you as a human look at an infrared scene, you simply see nothing. Similarly, modern telescopes, in short, simply don't at all make natural human light pictures. You can Google Hubble natural color images, which the scientists make to look that way. The scientists, so, all color is fake on these pictures. There is no actual color in any of these pictures. They just added. Here, take a look. This is, so this is the Hubble Extreme Deep Field on the sky. So this is the, this is the sky, the natural sky. And you can see there's no, you see just white stars. There's no red shift. You don't see this multicolored thing. But then suddenly, if you zoom in, oh, Suddenly, in this box, oh, there's all these colors. Where are the colors here? No colors. Bing, red and blue and green and whatever, in the box. Amazing. This is extreme deep field. Fake news. Okay, here. 26, again with the number 26. At least I don't have to invent 26 dimensions just to make the math come out. I didn't invent them, they're there. In what universe? In all of them, that's the point. Cosmic photos from the Hubble Space Telescope's Ultra Deep Field. Oh, again, we have the 216. December 16th, 2016. Wait, isn't that the same date that uh, Nine Inch Nails came out with their Fragile Sessions release? Announced on December 16th, 2016. 
And we got 12, 16, that's a 216, and another 216. Hmm. And we see these Hubble deep field reveals galaxies galore. And we see this picture. It's the same picture as of above. See the same four. There's the four again. There's the same picture. Sampling of galaxies. So it's the same picture. That looks like it's from the same picture. Snap Snapshot of pictures. And here's like a kind of mo uh, collage of different galaxies. And here's the same picture. There's the four again. Okay, this picture looks different. But then it goes back to this picture. 10,000 galaxies, same picture. These four, and there's that one. Same picture, just different coloration. I thought these were all 26 cosmic photos. They're all just one picture. Truth about Hubble, JWST, and false color. I get a lot of questions asking why the James Webb Space Telescope, that's the JWST, um, is infrared and how its images can hope to compare to the optical Hubble Space Telescope. Why would NASA build something that isn't going to capture beautiful images exactly like Hubble does? The infrared data that will come from JWST can be translated by computer into something our eyes can appreciate. In fact, this is what we already do with Hubble data. The gorgeous images we see from Hubble don't pop out of the telescope looking like they do when you view them on the web. Hubble images are all false color. Are all false color, meaning that they start out as black and white and are then colored. Most often this is to highlight interesting features of the object in the image as well as to make the data more meaningful. Sometimes colors are chosen to make them look as our eyes would see them, called natural color, but not always. Well, when is it natural color and when is it not? Maybe they're all fake. They wouldn't lie to you, would they? To uh, confirm the theory that they already decided is the truth. Look at this. And look at this. This is on Slate.com. The stars at night are big and bright, deep in the heart of the Milky Way. Let me show this amazing image. Sometimes you just need to look at pretty stars. That image was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope back in 2009. Interestingly, the stars are displayed pretty close to their natural colors. Hubble cameras are equipped with a wide variety of filters that let through light of not just various colors, but also various band passes, that is, the range of colors. But we just read here, Hubble images are all false color. <laughs> okay, as far as I can see, science is dead because Leonard killed it. And I don't know who the Romulans are, but those guys know how to party. <laughs> okay, so. That's my objection to the redshift evidence for an expanding universe. Uh, the other supposed evidence for the Big Bang is the constant bombardment we get from space of cosmic microwave background radiation from every direction. 